we get another opportunity to turn to Jesus by turning to his word to see what Jesus had let, left for us in his sufficient word so we can better learn about him and see how we can worship him better and how we can live a life that is, brings honor and glory to him. As you know, we are studying the, the gospel of Luke, and uh, last time we had finished chapter six. And today we're going to be starting to study in chapter seven, verses one through 10, about a centurion and this wonderful story about a person who amazed Jesus, a person who amazed Jesus in a positive way. Before we get to the story, I want us to just look at the context in which this story is written. Nothing in scripture is written out of order or just the random different stories or teachings thrown together. They are written uh, in a very logical and oftentimes chronological way. The biblical truths are presented in a very good order for us to better understand these truths. So let's look quickly at chapter six. The, the second half of chapter six Jesus is doing two things. He is teaching and he is healing. In verse 18, we read, so a large group of people uh, and along with the disciples, they gather, they bring the, the sick to Jesus and Jesus, he heals the sick. But most importantly, in chapter six, Jesus preaches. He preaches about the kingdom of heaven and what it looks like. He begins his sermon telling them about the blessings of the kingdom and the woes of the kingdom. And he says that blessed are the poor for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. He teaches them that a true disciple, a true follower of Jesus is someone who is lowly and meek and humble. Then he warns them about the, also the heavenly kingdom of what it's not like or what kind of people will not inherit the kingdom of heaven. Following that, we, he goes in to teach them a very challenging and a difficult message about loving their enemies. They had loved and practiced loving those who loved them in return, giving and helping those who would give and help them in return. But Jesus gives them this difficult message about loving enemies and lending, expecting nothing in return. Most importantly, he teaches large crowds of people what a true disciple looks like. And at the end of this great sermon that Jesus is preaching, he leaves them with two stories or parables. One is about a good tree that produces good fruit and a bad tree that produces bad fruit. And he emphasizes in the sermon and throughout about the heart, that good deeds come out of a good heart and the bad deeds come out of a bad heart. Heart is the issue, and in order to do good and to be good, the heart must be good. Jesus didn't want them just to take these, these truths or these principles and just add them on top of their to-do list, such as they believed they had to be circumcised, they had to pray a certain amount of times at a certain hour of the day, they had to give this much, they had to follow the Sabbath, love their friends, and Jesus didn't want them to teach a message and just have them add a few more things to their to-do list. Jesus wasn't interested in their behavior modification but in their heart transformation so that people would live out the Christian faith not because they're forced to but because they are changed and the key principle at the end of verse 45 we read it says for out of the abundance of the heart the mouth speak living out a Christian faith produces fruit that comes out of a changed heart of a good heart not a forced will. And so we live and we act because we are Christ followers, because we are his disciples. Therefore, we live that way. And lastly, he gives them an illustration and he encourages them not to just be hearers of the word, but to be doers of the word. 
It is like a person building a house on a rock who listens, who agrees, and who lives out that faith, as opposed to someone who builds on the sand, they hear the message, they might be even convicted by it, maybe they even take notes, but they don't do anything with it, they go and they forget the message. So Jesus encourages them and tells them to be hearer, not just doers. So he concludes this message, and that's the context that we get to in chapter seven. So in chapter six, he's preaching to the crowd. He finishes preaching. Then he goes out in chapter seven, out into the world, and he wants to see how will people respond to the message? Will there be people who are living out this message? And so that is the context that we see And we get to in chapter seven, open with me to Luke chapter seven. How do people respond and how do people live out this message? Luke seven, starting in verse one through 10. After he had finished all his sayings in the hearing of the people, he entered Capernaum. Now a centurion had a servant who was sick and at the point of death, who was highly valued by him. And when the centurion heard about Jesus, he sent to him elders of the Jews, asking him to come to heal his servant. And when they come to Jesus, they pleaded with him earnestly, saying, he is worthy to have you do this for him, for he loves our nation, and he's the one who built us our synagogue. And Jesus went with them, and he was not, when he was not far from the house, the centurion sent friends saying to him, Lord, do not trouble yourself, for I am not worthy to have you come under my roof. Therefore, I did not presume to come to you, but say the word and let my servant be healed. For I am a man For I am too a man set under authority with soldiers under me. And I say to one, go, and he goes, and to another, come, and he comes, and to my servant, do this, and he does it. When Jesus heard these things, he marveled at him, and turning to the crowds that followed him, said, I tell you, not even in Israel have I found such faith. And when those who had been sent returned to the house, they found the servant well. In today's story of the centurion, we will look at five character traits that the centurion had and that each and every one of Christ's followers should have, that we should have. We'll see that he was caring, he was loving, he was generous, humbled, And lastly, he possessed great faith. These five qualities, as we will see throughout scriptures, are qualities that each and every one of Christ's followers should have. Let's look at the story. Read about the centurion. Who was this centurion? Centurion, first of all, he was not Jewish like the other people in this story, but a Gentile. Most likely, he was a Roman soldier who had a hundred other soldiers under him, under his authority and power. He had, reached, he had reached this rank by fighting well, by exercising great skills and abilities in combat, in battle. He had behind him the whole Roman authority and law as he performed his duties as a centurion. He was well off financially. They got paid well, as we read later in verse five, that he was able to to finance the building of the synagogue for the Jews. So at the time, he was fairly well off and important. He had servants and slaves under him who obeyed and followed his orders. Now, being in this high position, the question is, how did he relate to others relate to those above him, those on the same level as him, and those below him, his servants and slaves. At that time, slaves were considered disposable and were treated that way. Some even said that the only difference between a slave and an animal is that a slave could speak. 
And that's how low they viewed these slaves that they had. They can buy and sell them. They can do whatever they want. And when they're no longer needed, they would get rid of them. But that's not how the centurion treated his slaves. He treated his slave differently. He treated his slave with honor, worth, and respect to the point that he was willing to go through trouble and challenges in order to heal him, in order to save him. He could have also said like the rest of the people, who cares if he is sick and will die? Everyone is replaceable. I'll find another servant or slave. But that's not how he had treated this, his own slave. He viewed them, and the word here is as valuable, as, as precious as that of a stone, honorable. And we see that centurion, he cared. He cared for all people. Not only those who were above him, not only those who were on his level, other centurions, but, but those who were below, on the lowest social level, the slaves. Not only did he care for for the slave and in theory somewhere down in his heart saying, you know, I care for you, but his life didn't line up in that way. No, he cared for his slave and that care manifested and displayed itself that he was able to, to go through all this uh, challenges to save so that his slave would be healed. He wasn't just caring for him in theory, but in practice and real life application. In verses three and four, Somehow the centurion heard about Jesus and what Jesus can do. Someone shared with centurion about Jesus and he believed. And so he called on some Jewish elders and asked them to go and to speak on his behalf to Jesus. It is important to know that the Jewish elders agreed the Jewish elders agreed and went as intermediaries to speak to Jesus on behalf of a Gentile. Jews usually look down on, upon Gentiles and here they go and speak to Jesus to heal centurion slave publicly on behalf on the Gentile. And that goes to show that the centurion, he had great respect and regard in the community. And that was not so of other centurions at that time. They were hated, they were despised by Jewish community. But in verse four, the Jewish elders, they, they went and they pleaded with Jesus earnestly on behalf of the centurion. They told Jesus that he is a good man, that he is worthy, that he has great, done great things for us. Please come and heal his servant. Centurion, he really cared and valued his slave to the point as to go through all of this to try to save his life. Jesus is another great example as we look at his ministry, at his life, who he was, he was a great example who demonstrated this kind of care and love. Throughout his ministry, he approached and he interacted with lepers, with the outcasts, with the worst sinners, yet Jesus showed a great example of caring for people because in God's eyes, all people are valuable and precious because they are made in his image. And a true believer is to value and to uplift others, not themselves. In the parable of Good Samaritan, we also see a great example of caring for others. This, this Samaritan went out of his way to care for someone he did not know. He spent his time, his energy, and money to help this helpless person who was in great need and on the verge of death. The Good Samaritan demonstrated a godly character of care for people. And throughout scripture, we read that we are called to care for others, to lift up others, to, uh, to value others, and consider them more important than ourselves. In Philippians chapter 2, verses 3 to 5, we read, Do nothing from selfish ambition or conceit, but in humility count others more significant than yourselves. Let each of you look not only to his own interests, but also to the interests of others. 
Have this mind among yourselves, which is yours in Christ Jesus. Consider others more important, more valuable than yourselves. In today's world, people really work hard to add value to themselves, to prove themselves as valuable, important, and oftentimes it's at the expense of stepping down on others and devaluing others but that is not Christ-like. Jesus does not command us to value ourselves, but to consider others more valuable, others more important, and to add value and consider others as more valuable and precious. Do we value others? Do we value, for, do we value them for who they are? Do we value for what other people have to say, for example? Or do we consider ourselves know-it-alls and we don't care about the opinions and ideas of others? Do we care what our spouse have to say, what our kids have to say? Or do, do we value their opinions or just our own? Do we look down upon them and careless for what they have to say because we've spoken and they must follow our orders? Mothers, you have children under your authority, oftentimes 24 seven. How do you treat them? With value, dignity, worth, or do, we find, do you find yourself saying things like, I don't care what you have to say, just go and do this. I have decided, I have concluded, I don't care what you have to say. We sure do, that, uh, we sure do value ourselves and what we think. That's no question. But do we value what others have to say? Do we even provide them with opportunities to speak and to share? Those of us who are managers, supervisors, business owners, or in any kind of position of authority, how do we treat those under our authority? Do we look down upon them? Do we value them or devalue them? Do we care for their well-being like the centurion or just our own? Just because someone is under our management or authority doesn't make them less valuable. They are just as valuable as you and I. Do we believe that? And do we live that? Do we value people or things? Do we value people or possessions? People for who they are or people for what we can get out of them? The tragedy today is that instead of using things and loving people, people do the opposite. They use people and love things. But Jesus and the centurion, they demonstrated a great and a wonderful example of how to care for others, how, you, how to value them, how to esteem them as higher than ourselves. The Bible teaches us that caring for others and counting others more significant than ourselves is a character quality and a heart attitude that each and every one of Christ's followers should have. Second quality characteristic that we see the centurion had was, was that he was loving. He was loving. It says in verse five, for he loves our nation. When the Jewish Leaders came to Jesus, they made requests and they appealed to Jesus to come and to do this to the centurion because he's a good person, because of his merits, because he loves the Jewish nations even though he was a Gentile. At that time, if we know what kind of relationship the Jews and the Gentiles had, it wasn't a positive one. Jews they considered themselves superior, God's chosen people, and all other people inferior and the outcasts. The Romans, they considered themselves superiors and the Jews inferior. So this centurion who was a Roman and the elders who were a Jewish, and normally they hated each other, but not in this case. They said they witness and said that he loves them, he loves our nation as opposed to hating. As Roman centurion soldiers, he did not have to love them. He had Roman power and authority behind him. He was there to keep the rule of law, possibly collect taxes, 
not to make friends or to be friendly. And Jews usually hated Roman soldiers and vice versa. But this centurion, he loved his enemies. Why? Because his heart was different. His heart was changed. His good fruit produced from a good tree of the inner heart. He lived out the message that Jesus preached to love your enemies. In many ways, he was the fulfillment of the message that Jesus preached. Jesus preached in chapter 6. He goes out to see who's living it out. And here is the centurion who's living out the gospel message, the principle of the kingdom of God. Turn with me to chapter 6. We'll read again quickly verses 27 through 36 about loving your enemies, which Max had preached so wonderfully in tongues, both in Russian and in English. Let's read starting in verse 27. But I say to you who hear, love your enemies, do good to those who hate you, bless those who curse you, pray for those who abuse you, to the one who strikes you on the cheek, offer the other also. And from the one who takes away your cloak, do not withhold your tunic either. Give to everyone who begs from you. And from the one who takes away your goods, do not demand them back. And as you wish that others would do to you, do so to them. If you love those who love you, what benefit is that to you? For even sinners love those who love them. And if you do good to those who do good to you, what benefit is that to you? For even sinners do the same. But if you lend to those from whom you expect to receive, what credit is that to you? Even sinners lend to sinners to get back the same amount. But love your enemies and do good and lend. Expect nothing in return and your reward will be great and you will be the sons of the Most High for He is kind to the ungrateful and the evil. The centurion was the fulfillment of the message that Jesus preached. Jesus preached this message, a difficult message, and here is an example of someone who's living it out, who's obeying it, who fulfills that message and shows a great example. He was a great example of Christ's love that overcomes boundaries, both national, the social, and others, so that others would see who they are and who Christ is, that they, through him they would see Christ's image displayed. Instead of hating, he showed love. Jesus said, by this people will know you. By this people will recognize you. By what? That we gather in this building on Sunday after Sunday or that we dress alike No, but that people would recognize us by who we are, our inner character, by the heart that loves one another. We are called to love because Christ first loved us and gave himself up for us. We are to love because we are partaker of his divine nature. And as God is love, so we reflect the love of God to all around because we are one with him. You see, we confuse the world. We confuse the people around us if the message we preach is not the message, message that we practice. If the message we teach is not the message that we live. The centurion, he overcame fear of rejection, overcame the comfort, overcame the societal norms that they are supposed to hate the Jews because he was a true disciple of Jesus. And so he cared and he loved Thirdly, we see at the second part of verse 5 that he was generous. It says, for he loves our nation. He is the one who built us our synagogue. Jewish leaders, they approached Jesus and pleaded the case for the centurion. They pointed to all the good things that he has done and they say that he's generous. He gave funds for the building of the synagogue. So the Jewish leaders, they wanted to return the favor or the good deed to the centurion by pleading with Jesus on his behalf. That is the third characteristic we see is that the generosity, the centurion was generous. And it, and it wasn't something that he claimed for himself. He wasn't giving and saying, look at me, I am so generous. But it is what others said about him. The only thing that he said of himself is that he is unworthy. 
In this case, what was told to Jesus about the centurion is that he's generous. He is the one who built us our synagogue. The word build emphasizes that the centurion took personal role to the degree that they had attributed all credit to the centurion for building this local synagogue. It doesn't say that you know, he helped him a little bit here. He came out and volunteered a couple of days or he donated $5, but he built it for us. He paid for all or most of the construction costs to build the synagogues for the Jews, his supposed enemies. MacArthur states that since the primary function of the synagogue was to teach the word of God, so the fact that he financed the building of the synagogue reflected Centurion's love for the truth. Again, Centurion's generosity was fulfilled, was the fulfillment of the message that Jesus preached. We just read, and let me read verse 34 one more time. It says, and if you lend to those whom you expect to receive, what credit is that to you even sinners lend to sinners to get back the same amount, but love your enemies and do good and lend, expect nothing in return and your reward will be great. The centurion gave generously, not begrudgingly, not under compulsion. He gave because his heart was generous. His heart was different and changed and out of the good tree of his heart he produced good fruit over and over again generosity is not measured in dollars and we know that when jesus was watching with the disciples when people were putting in the in the temples in the synagogues synagogues basket and some people put a lot they put a big dollar amount but then there was a widow who gave little but she gave all that she had and it teaches us that we don't have to be rich to be generous. Generosity is a heart attitude. It is who we are. Generosity is a heart attitude that can be practiced in different ways. Generosity of, of time, of energy, of help, of finances, and many other ways. The Bible teaches that and says that God loves a cheerful giver. And we are called to give because God gave he gave the most valuable, precious to him, the most treasured, which was his one and only son. And when we give freely and cheerfully and generously, we reflect and display the ultimate giver, God himself. True disciples of Jesus, like the centurion, are generous givers of their time, money, energy, etc., Fourth, we see that the centurion was humble, was very humble. Verse six and seven, it says, and Jesus went with them. So after pleading, he's now going to his house, to the centurion's house. And when he was not far from the house, the centurion sent his, sent his friends saying to him, Lord, do not trouble yourself for I am not worthy to have you come under my roof. Why didn't the centurion go to Jesus himself? Was he too busy? Or perhaps he just wanted to boss others around? Or maybe he was too cool or thought he was too important? Or maybe because he wasn't a Jew. So he asked other Jews to go and talk to Jesus and plead on his behalf. Because in that culture, the and the social, the national status, and the differences prevented people from talking to one another. The social disparity prevented one of inferior status to deal directly with someone of superior status. So the centurion, despite his rank and power as commander, he felt inferior to appeal to Jesus directly. So, so he asked the Jewish leaders to speak and approach Jesus on behalf. But what does the Bible say it was the reason why he didn't go? It says that he considered himself unworthy to talk to Jesus because he viewed himself as a sinner 
and believed that Jesus was holy and righteous. Verse six, it says, Lord, do not trouble yourself, for I am not worthy to have you come under my roof. And in verse seven, and I read the LSB translation, it says, for this reason, I do not consider myself worthy to come to you. The reason he didn't come to Jesus, and it says here twice, because he felt his guilt and shame and felt his unworthiness to come and to approach Jesus and speak to him face to face and request this healing for his servant. I am not worthy that you come to my house. I'm not worthy to be in your presence. In spite of all the great things that the Jewish elders said of me about my good deeds, generosity, love, worthiness, but I am not so, I am unworthy. Remember how Jesus began his sermon. Blessed are the poor, the spirit, the meek, the lowly, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. And in light of what the centurion heard about Jesus, he believed in him and in his power. He knew that he was unworthy to see Jesus face to face because he was a sinner, a beggar, but Jesus was holy and righteous. This was not false humility, but true humility. When the Jewish system When the Jews would proclaim this person as righteous, as worthy based on his works. But the centurion said, I am not worthy. I am sinful. Humility is realizing who we truly are in light of who Christ is, in light of scripture. And here are a few other examples of, in scripture where people came to grips of the truth of who they are and who Christ is. Peter, at one point, two chapters back in Luke, Luke 5, 8, Peter falls down on his knees and says, Depart from me, for I am a sinful man, O Lord. The prayer of the tax collector. He felt his guilt and shame. He was so ashamed of himself and his sinful condition that he would not dare even to look at the heaven and pray, Be merciful to me, O sinner. When Isaiah enters the presence of God. He says, woe is me for I am lost for I am a man of unclean lips who dwell in the midst of people of unclean lips for my eyes have seen the King, the Lord of hosts. Humility as displayed by centurion and explained in all of scripture is when someone realizes their true spiritual condition, first of all, their sinfulness, their brokenness, their inability to save themselves. That's the kind of humility that the centurion had. I wanted to touch on this principle of merit versus grace because the Jewish leaders, they, they pleaded a case to Jesus based on the centurion's merits, not ba- based on his good character, based on his good deeds. But the centurion says, sends the message arguing against that. He's saying, I'm not worthy. I am not relying on my good deeds, but on faith in your grace and mercy towards my slave. A genuine believer, when it comes to God, asking for Jesus to forgive, not based on the merits, not based on the list of accomplishments, but based on grace and mercy on what Christ has done. Apostle Paul, he had merits more than anyone. He had a long list of accomplishments, but he did not come to God and say, look at my resume, look at my status, my education, my background, my nationality, my good works, look at it, now accept me. No, he said, those merits are nothing, they are rubbish. I am not appealing to God and want to be accepted based on my merits, based on my works, but based on, my, on your grace and mercy, a gift and a deserved, so I appeal for grace. Then Centurion came to this realization and he came to realize that what I have done, it doesn't matter. And so I don't want you to heal this person because I have earned this and so you are repaying me for my good works. But I surrender, I humble myself, I am unworthy. But please show mercy and heal my slave. I believe because I have heard and I know that you have the greatest authority above all and you can heal. The story reminds us of the truth 
that all are unworthy in Romans chapter 3. No one can say to God, I am worthy to receive your grace. You owe me, Jesus, because I have done good works. Because grace is not something that we earn, but it's something that we can only receive. And if anyone thinks they are worthy, they have not come to understand the truth of the gospel. They haven't been transformed by the grace of God. Christ can only make those who see their depravity, their their sinfulness, their unworthiness. Until one surrenders all the merits, all the good deeds, Christ is of no value, we read in Galatians. But when one empties himself of himself, then Christ can make him new and makes him worthy through the righteousness of Jesus Christ. Centurion had great humility. And lastly, he had great faith. Verse 7, we read, Therefore I do not presume to come, let my servant be healed. Verse 8, For I am too a man set under authority with soldiers under me, and I say to one, go, and he goes, and to one, come, and he comes, and to my servant, do this, and he does it. When Jesus heard these things, he marveled at him. And turning to the crowd that followed him, he said, I tell you, not even in Israel have I found such faith. Centurion, he trusts Jesus without having ever met him in person. He only heard reports about Jesus, and he believed based on the information that someone told him about Jesus, and he believed and he acted on that, on that faith. His faith was not dead faith, but real. Faith not somewhere that he kept deep inside for himself, but faith that was displayed, that was manifested, that was lived out and poured out in action to those around him. When he talks and brings up this example. He says, Jesus, I I understand authority. I have people under my authority, but I understand and I believe that you have greater authority. You can say the word and the sermon will be healed. So say the word. You don't have to come to my house. You have much greater authority. Your words, they carry authority and what you say will come to be healed. A reality. The centurion, he voices a biblical truth that applies to all. His faith and his hope was not based on his own goodness and power, but on the goodness and the power of Jesus. He understood that his authority was small, but Jesus' authority was great. And he believed with such great faith where he said, you don't even need to come to my house. Wherever you are, no matter how far you are, just say the word and my servant will be healed. In contrast, as you remember the story of Mary and Martha and Lazarus, and Mary and Martha sends a delegation to call Jesus because their brother Lazarus was sick and was about to die. And when Jesus came a little late, four days They said, do not bother with that. And when Jesus approached them, says, oh, Jesus, if only you would come a little sooner, our brother wouldn't have died. Even though Martha and Mary, they knew a lot more about Jesus. They were friends. They they probably interacted many times. They probably saw in life Jesus heal people and perform miracles, yet they lacked faith that the centurion had, yet did not, they did not believe like the centurion. Centurion had faith like no other. He believed without seeing, and the Bible says that, blessed are you for you do not see, but yet you believe. He believed in a great God who is able to, with the word from his mouth, heal someone far away. Centurion's faith was radically different from the Jews' faith. Centurion believed in a great God who is able to heal, to forgive, to restore, while the Jews believed in their self-righteousness. The centurion was humbled and considered himself unrighteous, unworthy, while the Jews considered themselves righteous and worthy. It goes to show over and over again The message of scripture is that only the lowly, the meek, the humble can enter the kingdom of God. Amen? 
The self-righteous, the proud, the self-worthy have no place in the kingdom of God because the kingdom of God is not based on merits, not, but based on grace. Not based on what people can do, but what God, what Jesus has done. Not based on self-righteousness, but on Christ's righteousness. righteousness. The centurion understood and he believed, but the Jews did not. And so he tells Jesus, he, and so Jesus tells them that he has not found such great faith in all of Israel. If you notice, the people, they looked at centurion's deeds. But Jesus, he looked at his heart. People valued what this, what this centurion has done for them and for others, but Jesus looked at the, his heart condition, at his character. Sadly, people oftentimes value others not for who they are, but for what they have done for them. Instead of, instead of valuing people for their loving, caring heart, for their humility, for their faith, for their compassion and mercy, we often value and focus on what people have done for us. But that's not what Jesus cared and focused on, nor did the centurion. When we talk about valuing, caring for people, when we talk about being humble and generous, full of faith and good deeds, we are also talking about our identity, who we are in Christ. We're not talking about forcing ourselves to be humble once in a while or generous when others are looking or to care for people when the pastor or other believers are observing us. We're talking about character traits. We're talking about the heart. That's what Jesus preached. We're talking about the identity, who we are in Christ and how we live out that identity. We're not talking about a moment or event in our life, but a lifestyle of caring, of loving, of being generous and humble. Yes, there will be moments when as believers, we'll be arrogant, careless, heartless towards others, moments when we lack faith and courage, when we are ungenerous, but, th but those are not constantly present character traits of believers. If the person is constantly greedy, arrogant, faithless, full of bad deeds, it goes to show that they are not saved, that they are not a true disciple of Jesus Christ. However, if someone, despite struggling at times to be loving, caring, generous, humble, but is growing in those areas and is showing Christ-like character more and more often in their life, that person with their life, with their action, confirms that they belong to Christ, that their identity is that of a believer. Centurion was a great example of true disciple of Jesus the type of the disciple or follower that Jesus preached in previous chapter. He was caring, he was loving, he was generous, he was humble and full of faith. Lastly and in conclusion, I want us to look quickly at how Jesus responded. In verse nine it says, when Jesus heard these things, he marveled at him. This word marvel means to, to admire and to be in admiration, to marvel, to wonder, to be amazed, to be astonished. astonished. Jesus was amazed, he was wowed, he was astonished by centurion's faith. Centurion was the only person in all of scripture that amazed Jesus in a positive way. The only one. And we read that Jesus, he wasn't wowed or impressed or amazed by his riches, by his social status, by how many slaves he had, what kind of house he had, what kind of donkey he drove. He wasn't amazed by his generosity to give su such big amount of money to build this synagogue. He wasn't amazed by his looks, by his height, nor amount of followers on his social media. That didn't matter to Jesus. What Jesus marveled at was at his great faith. Throughout New Testament, you know what amazed Jesus? There's only two things. Two things that amazed Jesus in all of scriptures. And it was people's presence or absence of faith. People's presence or absence of faith. Nothing else. When Jesus preached in his hometown Nazareth, people didn't believe him. 
They lack faith. And in Mark 6, 6, it says that Jesus marveled at their unbelief. So Jesus marveled when people don't believe and when people show great faith. Who do we try to amaze or impress? Do we try to impress and amaze our friends, the things we do, the things we say, the things we have, or do we try to amaze Jesus by our heart attitude, by our love, by our faith? When we live in a godly way, produce good fruits from a good heart, Jesus will be pleased and people will appreciate and will speak well of us. Jesus is not amazed by all our accomplishments, the things we have and don't have, the places we visited. What he cares about is our heart, our character, our level of faith. What matters to Jesus is what he preached in chapter six and throughout all of scripture is that we become more like him in character, in our character. Like that of a centurion, that we would be caring, that we would value people, that we would love all people, including our enemy, enemies, that we would be generous with all that we have, humble and full of faith. That is the life that is pleasing to God, that amazes God. And the call for us is to live out that kind of life, to live out the gospel message that Jesus preached. And that's the life that would please him and would be a blessing to those around us. Amen. Let us pray. Jesus, we are thankful for your word that you left us. Thank you for your teaching that we get to read and that your teaching, it changes us. By the power of the Holy Spirit, you convict us, you transform us. We thank you that you have saved us and you have given us new life. Thank you for your saving work on the cross. It wasn't because of our good deeds, because of our merits, but because you have come and you have done what we could never do. God, we are unworthy, but you are worthy. Help us to realize that. Help us to care. Help us to value people to esteem them as more important and significant than ourselves. Forgive us for when we fail to do that. When we put people down, when we look, when we look down upon others, help us to be humble. Help us to be generous. Increase our faith like that of a centurion. God, help us not just to do these certain things, even ministries, Help us to live it out and help us to be those things. Change our hearts. That out of, a, out of a good heart we would produce these things. Not so that people would praise us, but that so that you would get the praise. You would get all the glory because you're the only one that deserves. And for those who do not know you as Lord and Savior, God, touch their hearts. Those who do not have a good heart that produces these things. And even though they try, it is hard for them. It is not natural. Would you save them? Save our children who do not know you as Lord and Savior. They wouldn't come to know you as Lord and Savior. We thank you for your word. Help us to be obedient and to live it out in our lives, not just to be hearers, but be doers, we pray. Amen.